Good morning. My name is Scott McMorrow, uh, consultant with TerraSpeed Consulting, which is a division of SamTech. TerraSpeed Consulting was, uh, has been in business for 12 years. I've been a consultant for over 25 years in the area of high-speed signal integrity. Um, and uh, in May of this year, SamTech acquired my company, uh, expanded our operations, um, and now we have a much larger signal integrity uh, design and consulting firm. We specialize in high speed and ultra, ultra high speed design uh, for uh, this generation and next generation products. What I'm going to talk about today is um, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is high fidelity signal integrity modeling. What I mean by that is, and so during this presentation we're going to talk about some of the elements of what I call high fidelity modeling. We're going to talk about connector modeling, launch design, making precision measurements. We're then going to talk about what's known as PC material anisotropy, which is the variation of the properties of the material uh, in our printed circuit boards that affect performance. Then we're going to talk about uh, practical uh, printed circuit board trace modeling, trace and dielectric modeling followed by some measurement de-embedding and how we use that in order to uh, better understand the properties of, of our materials, our modeling methods, and then uh, allows us to benchmark our electromagnetic solvers so that we uh, believe the results that we uh, receive with them. And then finally, once we've done all of this and we believe our simulations, we believe our modeling, we can now use it to do virtual uh, design of systems and perform statistical analysis of entire systems with high confidence. So what I'd like to talk about is um, avoiding what I call modeling-induced hallucinations. That is, we have simulators that are very powerful and we can type in some numbers, bring in our boards, bring in our traces, bring in our connectors, and we can press a button and get a result. Now, when I went to school, we used a slide rule. And we, had to th we actually had to think about the problems, and we had to um, know the answer before we, we had to know where the answer was going to be before we actually derived a final answer. Um, and today, a lot of engineers uh, just assume that the tools are correct, just assume that their models are correct, and they believe the results. And many times, these are hallucinations. They're not correct. And so we can have incorrect measurements, incorrect geometry of the components and of the traces. We can have incorrect material properties. We can have our electromagnetic solvers with incorrect settings or non-accurate settings. And we can have in incorrect boundary conditions, the space around our problems. Those can all be issues in the fidelity of the modeling. So this presentation is about limiting those hallucinations and creating very high fidelity, high uh, uh, accuracy models. So high fidelity model, modeling is faithful to what the physics of the system is. So we're physics-based models. We use accurate measurements in order to ensure that the, uh, uh, we use accurate measurement technology to help enable our measurements and use solvers to help to refine our measurement capabilities. We uh, use cross-sectioning to confirm the trace geometries that we're using so that we actually are simulating what we actually have on, we have on our board. Our material properties are always measured and not assumed. We don't believe the manufacturers of the material. We check them ourselves and we find that the manufacturers are often wrong or over-optimistic in their predictions of their materials. <clears throat> our solver settings are characterized adjusted, optimized, and we benchmark them against known structures and known good measurements. And then once we've done this, we can have final modeling results that can be taken into very advanced statistical simulations to create the broad spectrum of uh, operation of the system across all temperature uh, and manufacturing uh, uh, corners. So where we start is in taking connectors uh, looking at them, and in this case, this is a, an RF connector that's, board, that's launched on, it's mounted onto a board, and it's a fairly simple connector. Um, and we worked on a project where we um, did some measurements of that connector and found that the VSWR, the uh, signal reflecting back, uh, 
was very high at uh, mid frequencies where we wanted to measure. So at about 25 gigahertz, which is one of the areas that we wanted to uh, have good data on our boards. And so along with the manufacturer, we looked at that connector, performed some internal optimizations in the way that it mounts on the board and how it interfaces with the board, and we were able to reduce that uh, VSWR to a very acceptable level so that we had a good, high-quality connector launch into the board. Once we do that, we then look at the structure trying to attach to uh, strip line traces. We, since most boards, uh, most of our routing, high-speed routing on boards are through strip lines, uh, we want to ensure the highest quality signal transition into the strip line out to very high frequencies. So what we do is we take those two connectors, model the entire board, a small section with a trace in between, and then we perform uh, aggressive op optimizations by looking at um, what we can do to modify those structures. And this is an example of some of the aggressive optimizations. Instead of just simple vias and simple pads, we use a scalloped pad approach to reduce capacitance. On different layers, we use different structures. We different, use different annular ring hole sizes uh, for plane clearances. And we even include little diving boards to guide the signal at like a waveguide off of the connector as it travels through the rabbit hole, down through the board, and out onto the trace. In doing this, every one of these structures is parameterized and can be optimized in an electromagnetic simulator. And when we do that and we make the measurements of the board, here's the actual physical uh, artwork. That's a, a physical, physical uh, picture of the, uh, uh, of the uh, launch on top of a board. And we see this um, return loss, I don't see my scale here, is actually extremely good out to 10, 20, 30, 40. This is 50 gigahertz out here. So this is a uh, measurement of a connector going through a trace on a printed circuit board coming up, and we have 50 gigahertz of bandwidth launched into our uh, strip line traces. Once we're able to use, once we have that kind of uh, bandwidth and precision in our uh, launches, we can now use that to make further measurements on our boards. Now on the other side, inside of the board, we, we want to understand how the traces work and how the traces operate at very extremely high frequencies. Today we are designing uh, 28 gigabit per second systems uh, through our consulting with many customers, designing packages, boards, backplanes, systems. Um, and we'd like to understand the, the trace uh, operation in real systems. So here's an example of a uh, cross-section of uh, a single-ended uh, strip line and a differential uh, strip line trace. And what you'll see is the ground planes, the dielectric in between, and the uh, traces themselves. And what's very, very important is that it's hard to see, but these ghosts, uh, these ovals, that is the uh, fiberglass inside of the board. So this is a non-uniform anisotropic dielectric that is layered with epoxy, fiberglass, spaces in between. And what's very interesting is in the region of a differential trace, there is no fiberglass. It is all epoxy. Now it turns out that fiberglass, uh, general fiberglass used for printed circuit boards, has a dielectric constant of about 5.6. Um, the epoxy is used to create a, a board in order to average the entire a dielectric constant out to create an isobar of 3.5 requires a dielectric that has a dielectric constant of about 2.3 or 2.4. So we have a very low isobar material and then a very high isobar material that is essentially mixed together, fiberglass and epoxy, that creates our average isobar. But the average is only across a large section measured in, in dielectric resonators at, in, using microwave techniques. When we're dealing with traces, the traces, so the macroscopic properties average out, but the microscopic properties do not. And the traces, because the traces and the uh, weave are on the same microscopic level, the uh, fiberglass influences the trace properties which then vary locally in different sections of the board, 
and between one side of the trace and the other. This gives rise to skew within differential pairs, impedance variations, <coughs> and modal conversion from differential to common mode and to other higher order modes. So a simple picture of that, my, uh, my very simple picture shows you know, what I'm talking about. You've got a, a low ESA bar dielectric, a high ESA bar fiberglass, and then you have traces in between along with a pure epoxy section that's very low E sub R. So we have a multi-layered medium that has multiple modes of propagation. Multi uh, each one of these uh, electromagnetic energy propagates at different velocities and that causes problems with those uh, differential pairs. So what we're going to do is use our connectors to now create test structures to, cre to do, perform some measurements of uh, these uh, material properties. So we have cross sections, we're going to create measurements in the material properties, and we're going to use a method that's called global modal S parameters, which allows us to use traces of two different lengths and uh, mathematically de-embed the properties of the delta length between the two. We, now, we can then use that in order to um, look at the properties and actually extract the physical material properties of the board, of, the, of those traces on the board in their environment with two measurements. So what we're going to do is, it's a, it's a five step process that we use to do this. We use group delay or the time delay for the signals in the delta section to get us in the right ballpark, in the right range um, of E sub R's. It gives us our, our first guess. We're then going to look at potential variation in multiple traces because there's variation from lot to from from trace to trace to trace to find a reasonable average. Um, from that, we're going to identify the low frequency characteristics near DC so that we can establish the uh, con conductivity of the copper because conductivity of copper is copper on printed circuit boards is not pure. It contains impurities, and so its conductivity is actually lower than pure copper. Uh, we're going to adjust for the dielectric loss, so we're going to change the, tr the loss of the material to match the measurements. And then, as a final step, we're going to look at, we're going to adjust for the uh, surface roughness of the copper to finally adjust for the actual insertion loss of the entire, of the entire measured trace. When we do that, we start out with two me the measurements of these two delta links. So we have two different delays. Those two different delays gives us an, the ability to go in and come up with a guess for the, for, for the E sub R, the, the basic E sub R of the material. Now the dielectric constant of the material changes with frequency. It goes down with frequency as a, uh, uh, as a consequence of causality. Um, causality being that signals can't travel faster than the uh, speed of light in a media. So as we, whenever we introduce loss to a material, the dielectric constant has to go down and the loss tangent has to go up with frequency. And that's, a, that's because of causality. So this gives us our first guess. Now we're going to go back and we're going to look at the variation in multiple traces. After we've done that, we're going to identify the uh, low frequency characteristics. You see we're below uh, one gigahertz down in here. And this allows us to adjust our copper conductivity to give, a, knowing our cross section, we have a measurement of the low frequency loss. We can now uh, determine very accurately what the copper conductivity is. Now you can even do that with an ohmmeter. Um, and so we get a very good match at low frequencies, but you see as we go up to higher frequencies, we diverge in the loss properties. So that means that our dielectric loss is still not high enough yet. So now, to adjust for dielectric loss, it turns out since we know that the E sub R goes down with frequency, dielectric loss can be used to adjust uh, and measured against the delay of the system in order to create a very high uh, degree of matching at ultra high frequencies, in this case 20 to 40 gigahertz. And you can see for each of those two traces, our measurement versus our model are extremely, extremely close. And then once we have that adjusted, 
the remainder of our loss has to be in the copper. It has to be the surface profile, the surface roughness of the copper. So then we adjust the surface roughness in order to uh, match the insertion loss. And so in the end, what we have is a measurement and a simulation model that exactly matches broadband from DC to 50 gigahertz, both in magnitude attenuation and in phase or in, in delay across the entire frequency band. Once we have this, we have a model that we can actually use and take into further simulations. So in one case, this is a particular simulation environment. This is Ansoft SI Wave, which is a board level tool that uses layered dielectrics and cavities and uh, simulation of uh, traces with method of moment solvers. Um, and one important thing that we have to do to, in order to get good correlation to measurements is create very nice uh, pristine launches and we do that by proper grounding of the ports right around the, uh, the trace so that we don't excite cavity modes inside of the solver. Um, here's an actual measurement of a particular trace. So this is a differential pair. <clears throat> it is, there's a medium trace and a long trace, 9 and 16 inches. It is built on Megtron 6, which is a high performance, low loss material. Um, and this is, this is a strip line. So electromagnetic theory says that strip line is a balanced media. If it has a uniform dielectric constant, then it's, because it's balanced, forward crosstalk is zero, theoretically zero. This is not a balanced media. This is a layered dielectric. And so when we make our measurements, we see insertion loss, return loss, and then we also see crosstalk here. And can I use my pointer? No, I can't. I'm sorry, we see uh, return loss here, but then we also see crosstalk, and one of those crosstalk components is the forward crosstalk between the two traces. Pure strip line, that should not exist. In real strip line, it does exist, and we can see the, the level of crosstalk that we, uh, we achieve with that. So that's an indication that we have a non isotropic media. Now, uh, our modeling assumes what we call the Georgievic Sarkar models, which uh, were, uh, it's a recent uh, microwave dielectric model used for modeling printed circuit board materials. And this is what I was talking about before. In order to main cause, uh, maintain causality, the E sub R has to decrease with frequency, and the loss tangent has to have a positive slope with, with frequency. And it turns, and this is what we use to actually model our materials and correlate them to measurement. So here's an example of um, a model to measurement correlation of our physical measurement and our model in ANSYS SI wave. And what you'll see here is the, uh, the actual measurements start having some signal to noise ratio problems. So these were not particularly great measurements. They were made by one of my customers and had a lot of ripple above about 12 or 13 gigahertz. Yet, this is still sufficient for, oh, 20, 20 to 20, 24 gigabit operation. It's very, very close. And you see that the measurements, black is the, uh, 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 black is the, the model, the red is the measurement, and you see that the correlation, the match between the two is very, very close up to at least 12 or 13 gigahertz and then starts to diverge. Now there's some reasons why those measurements uh, begin to diverge, which we'll talk about in just, a, in just a moment. But the idea is we're matching both amplitude attenuation plus delay or phase so that all structures are modeled correct, co correctly in all directions on the board. So what we see, um, another way of looking at this modal separation that we, me that we measured through forward crosstalk is we can look at phase and we can see that the common mode is the slower mode and the differential mode is the faster mode. We can see that in the phase plots because the phase rotation is different. We can see that also in the uh, group delay plots where we can see that uh, 
in mo because of modal separation, the differential mode is faster. It's embedded in very low loss, low low, low isobar material. The um, common mode is slower because it uses the full breadth of the material, and in in, in sweeps in the uh, fiberglass. So we can see that this is the cause of that modal, this is the result of that modal separation. And we can even plot the even mode match for our material. Mo so that means that when we model this material, we can't use one isobar and one loss tangent. We have to use layered isobar materials. We have to guess at what the layering is, and we have to actually model that internal dielectric layer. Once we can do that, we can create a simulation that matches the even mode propagation and the odd mode propagation. And now you can see that the energy that we're losing uh, in, in signal to noise ratio at higher frequencies is because of the, the odd mode uh, common mode uh, dielectric dispersion that's happening because energy is now starting to radiate out across the system. It's not being contained. And so we're actually losing it into the cavity. So when we make measurements of multiple boards and multiple test vehicles, uh, here's an example of absolutely identical, identical traces measured with microprobes um, out to 40 gigahertz. And what you see is most of the measurements cluster around one trajectory. So that's the, essentially the general loss of the material and the general dielectric constant of the material. But there is one outlier. And that outlier, we need to understand it. And the way we understand it is not only do we have these dielectric material properties changes the mode of propagation, but because there is a variation, of the uh, traces traveling over the planes. One is over fiber like this, and the other might be over epoxy. We generate skew in the signal. And if we generate skew in the differential pair, uh, skew uh, converts differential mode energy into common mode. We can measure that, and for this particular 20-inch trace, we had 12 picoseconds of skew. So for a trace this long, 12 picoseconds of skew was accumulated across that distance. That skew results in loss of amplitude, so insertion loss that increases with frequency. Um, we can measure that, but it turns out that it's actually a fairly simple modeling effort that once we know the worst case skew in our system based on our material properties and based on measurements, we can add that skew into our models simulate it, and now we understand where that divergence uh, at these high fre higher frequencies is occurring. That skew is causing our loss curve to bend down. And so Megtron 6 material properties generally look like this, but in a real system, some of the traces have different properties due to skew. So when we perform system simulations, we have to take that into account and so effectively skew in the system causes an, eff an effective increase in the loss tangent of the material. The loss tangent hasn't changed, it's just it effectively has changed because we're losing energy to common modes. So the next thing that we can do is, okay, we have these material properties, we're using trace solvers which are known to be very highly accurate, we're measuring the properties, we're matching those uh, properties to our models and simulation. So now we're going to use de-embedding techniques with multiple structures and multiple de-embedding methods. Um, in order to benchmark our, our solvers to, so that we believe that we know, that we believe the results. And I do this on every solver that I use, which is why we've chosen to use uh, ANSYS, uh, HFSS, and SI Wave because we've spent uh, essentially about five years in understanding the material properties and benchmarking those solvers in order to uh, understand how, whether they match the results or not. Now here's an example of a particular kind of a resonator called an offset resonator that creates lobes. We use a, very, a lot of different kind of resonant techniques. Here's an example of a test board 
with uh, calibration structures. This is TRL calibration for de-embedding. And these are different kinds of uh, classical and non-classical uh, test structures that we can use to measure and compare to our uh, solvers. We have uh, further advanced kind of the state of the art in what we've done and created um, measurement platforms that are designed to find um, very specific issues that can occur with solvers. So here's an example of a measured uh, simulation, uh, measure, a measurement, the SI wave simulation and the HFSS simulation from zero to 20 gigahertz and you can see the the match is extremely high. We've de-embedded down to the specific uh, resonator structure. It's a uh, low impedance um, resonator placed inside in, into a line. We simulate that, we measurement, measure that. Because we have accurately dialed in our material properties, uh, we can now determine whether the solver is actually modeling this uh, structure correctly, and it does. It's a fairly simple structure, should have been easy to model. It turns out there's quite a few solvers that can't model that correctly. So then we can take more complicated structures. On printed circuit boards, we often have to uh, delay match uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of traces, and we use some form of a meander line. Well, it turns out in microwave uh, techniques, a meander like that is just a bandstop filter. And you can cascade multiple bandstop filters and create different filters with different cues. And you can clearly see that bandstop here. You can see that the, insertion, the return loss becomes nearly zero, and the insertion loss becomes uh, much lower. And here we can see the correlation between uh, these solvers and uh, multiple solvers and that line, uh, some, the blue is actually the measurement and the red is the simulation. You see that everybody's just a little bit off because we're not modeling that meander line quite exactly. There are etching changes along the corners. Uh, we're not, we're not a, a totally faithful reproduction, but we can see at least one of the solvers, which was HFSS, was very, very close to the actual uh, measured uh, result. So there's limits in terms of some physical structures are so complex we cannot capture all of the features. However, we can parameterize that. We can change the sections uh, in modeling and model the corners and the the connecting section and the space and the etch width variations. And we can now look at this statistically and look at that kind of variation statistically for manufacturing reasons. Uh, the other thing we can see is that kind of structure has a bandwidth limitation of about, in this case, of about seven, seven gigahertz. So that tells me that if I use that kind of a meander structure um, at 14 gigabits per second, it's about as fast as I go. Beyond that, I'm going to lose a significant signal. So being able to benchmark that structure, I can now alter the way I do my meander and use a different technique that doesn't have that kind of a bandstop property. Here's another saw. It's, this is something that happens. We don't like to pass traces over holes in the planes, but we do it. This was actually uh, modeled on a, actually measure, measurements and models from a physical package that we had designed specifically for testing solvers up to 40 gigahertz. In this case, when we ran it into one solver, ran that result. This is actually the correct result. I don't show measurements here, but when we ran it in one solver, a SI Wave, the classic solver, we got this result. It was clearly wrong. It was clearly incorrect. You wouldn't have known it um, if you'd done a simulation and pressed the button and you hadn't benchmarked it. You wouldn't have known this was a problem. Went back to the engineers uh, at Ansys. Um, and showed them the problem. What we find is when we make precise measurements, show them the simulations with HFSS, the guys at Ansoft believe HFSS. It's their golden standard internally. Uh, so we said, here are the measurements, here's the HFSS result, they match, this is what your other solver gives us, can you please fix it? Six months later, we had a new solution, which was this 3D domain decomposition method, where they, at these kind, when they 
identify those particular kinds of structures that they can't model classically, they go in and they run a 3D solver in that region. They cut it out, run a 3D solver on demand, and then stitch it into their modeling. And they get almost essentially the same result. So in this case, we were able to use this high fidelity modeling technique to develop the confidence that, our software, that the software engineers could go in and modify the tool. Um, here's an example of a, we took differential vias that were designed to couple to each other and we looked at the simulation versus the measurements and you see that the insertion loss is actually very very good for this solver up to 25 gigahertz. This is ANSYS SI wave it's, uh, there's some approximations in its modeling approach that start to break down. It doesn't simulate all the possible modes of propagation. Um, it assumes TEM mode propagation. It assumes cat for traces. It assumes cavity modes for the uh, uh, planar cavities. And it assumes, um, uh, it uses approximations around the vias. And those start to break down. But we now know that they break down around 25 gig gigahertz which means that that solver is valid for 28 gigabit per second system design and uh, extractions. And you can see that not only does our insertion loss match up to that point, but also our near-end crosstalk is almost a dead match. You see that our, um, our squiggly lines, that's the measurements, our nice pretty curve, those are the simulations. And you can see again, up to about 20 to 25 gigahertz is a very good match. And then there's some divergence. We also see there's some divergence in the peaks over here, which tells me that the, something in the phase is changing with frequency. It probably had to do with our de-embedding methodology. De-embedding isn't exactly precise. So there's always, if this is the point at which I want to de-embed this pretzel, that's, that's where I want to de-embed it from here to here but I have some range of error, and that error will be seen at ultra high frequencies. Once we've done this kind of modeling, now we can go back and create models for an entire system. This is a, mo this is a simulation of a high performance backplane um, for military applications. It wasn't incredibly fast. This was actually running eight gigabits per second. It was PCI Express Gen 3. We modeled the packages, the traces on the cards, the capacitor was accurately modeled, the connector was modeled and its via transitions, the traces on the backplane were modeled, and the other card were all modeled. We then parameterized those models um, and uh, were able to vary the lengths of the traces on the cards, the length of the traces on the uh, printed circuit on the backplane. We were able to vary the impedances so we could look at different impedances. So you'll see over here that uh, this particular simulation is 8 gigabits per second, 110 ohms on, the, on one card, 85 ohms on, another, on the back plane, and 110 on the other. So we're looking at the worst case mismatch in the system and trying to find out where the extremes are. And now we can sweep that, and this was uh, 11,000 simulations were run with all of these variations so that we could look at the statistical eye height as seen at the receiver in a statistical eye simulator um, across all of the different lengths of the uh, s possible lengths of the system. So in this case, this was a 30, uh, the entire system trace length, length was 30 inches. Uh, yeah, 30 inches, 30,000 mils. Over here, it was about one, about one inch, so about two inches, so about one inch on the back plane and one inch on the card. So we're looking at all potential variations. And so now we can start seeing interesting features. For example, we can see that our worst case is always when we're running high impedance on the cards, uh, low impedance on the cards and high impedance on the boards. That's when we get the worst case mismatch. We can see that we have some issues when we're worst case mismatched when the uh, system is uh, uh, very short because we're not absorbing the energy. We don't have enough loss to absorb the energy. But we see that it's well above our compliance limit, so it's OK. So now we can use this to create guidance to what is the worst case uh, short trace and long trace. 
and uh, what layer. So over here it's cut off, but this is the layer on the back plane, the bottom layer, the top layer, the middle layer. So which layer is the best performing layer? And this included uh, 12 differential pairs in the simulation through traces, vias, connector fields, um, and looked at insertion loss and crosstalk, and then performed statistical analysis of the eyes with all of that crosstalk and all of that insertion loss and mismatch in the system. So once we've been able to go through this high fidelity measurement process, uh, uh, modeling process, we now have uh, these, the confidence to go in and fully characterize systems. And we do that with backplane systems, card systems, connectors, all of that. And that's uh, what we do at SAMTEC. Here's another example where that previous simulation assumed that there was no skew. Remember, the traces have skew. So now the question is, if I add skew to the differential traces, what happens to my eyes? And so what we see is that when there's, of course, no skew, this is, we get a 90, a 60 millivolt eye height. When we have five picoseconds of skew, the uh, equalizers in the parts are still able to correct for that. And then suddenly there's a point at about 10 to 12 picoseconds of skew that suddenly the insert the eye height goes down. And what's happening is we're losing not only amplitude, but because of mode conversion, we're converting that, uh, that differential energy to common mode. It turns out that connectors and via pin fields are not designed for containment of common modes. Common modes radiate in space, they radiate within the board, and they cause crosstalk. So this, when we finally diagnosed it, was that the transmitters were transmitting um, high amplitude signals. The receivers had very long traces across the backplane, so they had high attenuation. The skew from the transmitter to the connector was causing common mode conversion that would then burst out as radiation. And it doesn't just go to its neighbor, common mode skips across the board. So it's, it's what we call non-localized uh, behavior or non-localized crosstalk. And so we were able to give our customer guidance that said, you have to control your skew end to end in the system to within uh, 12 picoseconds. We further were able to identify that the most important place to control skew is on the cards because that's where the high uh, amplitude energy is and that's where the potential for common mode occurs. So just like high fidelity audio, we, re we, we uh, record the sound, we then press the sound and uh, put it on some digital media that, that if you put it on lossless, if you put it on lossy media like MP3, there will be a distortion of the sound. If you put it on a lossless media, there will be an absolute reproduction. If we have the right equipment, the right speakers, the right amplifiers, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're doing high fidelity, high precision measurements, characterization of material properties, characterization of solvers. Once we've gone that, we went, this has been about a seven year process for my company and some of the companies that I have consulted with. Um, that process is now known. We don't have to replicate it anymore. If we go to a new solver, we can use that. We can, we'll have to go through this process again. Every time we have a new material, we'll recharacterize that material. But once we know the properties, we can now, um, we can now, we now have modeling results and simulation results that we absolutely trust. And we can then go back and if we find a deviation between our models and our measurements, it's usually because we've discovered something new that we didn't understand previously. And often it has to do with that layered material property. So um, that's our process. And we use this in uh, the Terraspeed Consulting Group side of SAMTEC. It's also been brought into the SAMTEC modeling for all of their new and next generation connectors. Uh, in the process, we've had to buy an extreme amount of software and high performance and computing equipment, but we can now solve problems that used to take a week in about two to three hours or half a day.
and that's what we use in order to uh, create the systems that we do in consulting and uh, that we do use to uh, model and uh, uh, design new connector systems. Thank you very much.